the Supreme Court says it will hear the case of the 300 plus people that are being prosecuted along with Donald Trump for the January 6th situation. Now the court has agreed to hear this case. It's Joseph Fisher who's indicted on seven charges for his role in the J6 attack. He was charged with the obstruction count known as, okay, we're gonna get really esoteric here, 18 USSC 1512. Now those of you that have been following this, at at an intricate level, you know all about this, but basically you get 300 people or so that are being held in jail right now as a result of this 18 USSC 1512. It was part of Dodd-Frank's, it was really actually designed to go after white collar crime, but they have used it in this particular case to go after these individuals and to go after Donald Trump. Now what's interesting about it is that if for some reason the Supreme Court decides that it's not applicable in this case and they couldn't use this 18 USSC 1512, then Merrick Garland and the DOJ and Jack Smith, they're gonna have a lot of egg on their face. I think that's like a big deal. So you've just effectively caught the country up in this whole thing. And if the Supreme Court decides, now they're taking up the case, that it's a no-go, what does that mean? Let's think about that for a second. I want to go to some of Julie Kelly's commentary on this. Now, Julie Kelly is a reporter, and she's been just in the trenches on this in ways that are really interesting. She's like, holy you-know-what. Supreme Court will review 1512. C2, obstruction of an official proceeding case. So, like, you're not supposed to be able to go in and obstruct Congress from doing its job And what the allegation is, is because those people were there on January 6th, Congress wasn't able to go through, right, with this transition of power. They were obstructing Congress from moving forward with its official proceedings. And so that's what they're using here. And she points out that this is the felony used against 300 plus J6ers and represents half of Jack Smith's indictment against Trump. If the Supreme Court of the United States, she writes, determines that DOJ has misused the statute, it'll be a game changer. And she goes on to explain, very interesting. She also writes that, you know, let me, let me quote this one. It's effectively a collision course with Jack Smith. And the reason she's writing that, she says, it's because they're going to hear these oral arguments. The Supreme Court will in like March or April. And that's the exact same time that Donald Trump is on trial for the same charge, right? So it's going to to the DC court and he's gonna be charged with this in March. It's scheduled for March 4th, 2024. So that's happening around March or April. All of the Supreme Court is also looking at the case. And the thinking is the lower court's gonna have a ruling and then the Supreme Court will either agree with that ruling or they will not uphold it. So if, if the ruling sticks and the, and the Supreme Court says, yep, you know what, 18 USSC 1512, that means you, know, y- you were able to use this, you were able to use the obstruction count, then Donald Trump would be most likely in jail. But, 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 if the Supreme Court feels that Jack Smith and the DOJ and Merrick Garland overstepped their bounds of power, well, then that sets up a scenario for the Supreme Court telling the lower court, nope, no can do, you're wrong. And let's not forget the style of government that we are. The Supreme Court is the ultimate ruler in this one. So the Supreme Court would have the final say. So Jack Smith, for whatever reason, wanted to push this forward, wanted to get it to the Supreme Court. Some have speculated that perhaps it's political. If he knows he's gonna get a verdict, that puts you know, Trump in the slammer in March or April or May or June, he might actually want the Supreme Court to actually say no can do. And then you set up this really difficult political environment that, well, some worry would actually bring us to some kind of civil war because that's the breakdown in power that nobody wants. So there's not enough to entirely know how to interpret this. But I'm going to go back to Julie for a second because, again, she's like all over in the weeds on this. She said if, if Trump is, is convicted by a D.C. jury, then the Supreme Court comes down with its decision in June, and she said it's the same month that Judge Chutkin would be prepared to sentence Trump. Bonkers, she writes. 
She also says this is the day that so many J6ers have been waiting for. So again, it is bonkers. I agree with Julie on that because you're setting a scenario up right now where the Supreme Court, their ruling will, will be held, right? Like it's the Supreme Court, you don't mess around with that. But if in fact you've got two different rulings, does that get people really, really riled up and put you in an environment going into the election in November of 24 that is, oh, I don't know, kind of like some sort of civil war scenario? I don't want to be alarmist when I say that. I mean, I've said it before and people are, oh, you know, but, and I'm not talking like real on, full on civil war with generals and weapons and that kind of thing, but some kind of distancing. I would, I, I, I worry about that. In some ways, you could say we're kind of in it right now. I think we're working our way through it. I looked at some of the things that have been happening at the Ivy League circle, right, to suggest that we're working our way through it. We'll get to that. But if we're in a civil war right now, does it escalate as we get closer to the election and we get closer to these rulings? That would be of great concern and something that Hollywood is already trying to capitalize on. Don't forget, I played the clip the other day for you of the MSNBC analyst who's a lefty saying, you know, you know how they're going to have to win this election. Forget Bidenomics, right? Because nobody believes Bidenomics is actually working. They need to double down on the dictatorship and the fear factor of the dictatorship. Well, Hollywood's getting the message. They're doubling down on it. They are coming out with a brand new movie titled None Other Than Civil War for Spring 2024, starring Kristen Dunst. Let's catch a preview of this little number. 19 states have seceded. The United States Army ramps up activity. The White House issued warnings to the Western forces as well as the Florida Alliance. The three-term president assures the uprising will be dealt with swiftly. Yeah, lovely, lovely. So uh, you know where this is going, right? So Hollywood is Hollywood, right? But do not forget, do not forget how we have been conditioned to kind of think one way and people are like, hey, wait a second, wait a second. And they stop in their tracks and they're like, you know, I don't know, this makes a whole lot of sense. I really don't think it does. And then they start to think about things and they're like, oh, maybe. That. And then what do you know? It turns out when you think they're telling or they say they're telling the truth, they're actually not. And then vice versa. I want to use January 6 as an example, not to say that any of this should have happened. Don't get me wrong. I'm not condoning this. I, I was really horrified by what I saw happening outside the Capitol building. But here's the thing. We don't know what happened inside the Capitol building. We don't. We heard some scary stories. And then we saw some video played over and over and over again in a loop. If we have this, I'm just checking with our, our team here. If we have this, I'd like to play it for you again, because it's something I like to bring up. You know, Nancy Pelosi she knew that there might be some issues, right? And she apparently didn't want to bring in the Capitol Hill police. And technically speaking, Trump didn't have the authority to actually do that. That was her call. And so she, she could have done it. She didn't. But she did make a call. And she made a call to right away to her daughter, Alexandra Pelosi. She invited her in there for that particular day. Her daughter happens to be a documentary film producer, not a news producer, a documentary film producer and coming from this business, I understand the distinction. There's a lot of leading, there's a lot of special scary music, all this kind of stuff that they do in the documentary business that you wouldn't do in news. And they thread it together to have a lot of little storytelling, shall we say, to boost a certain narrative. So she brings in her daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, to tell the story of January 6. And this is all we saw over and over and over and over again. And yet, at some point, the public got so brainwashed, CNN stopped telling us that it was shot by Alexandra. They bought it from her. And they bought it from HBO, who she was apparently making a, a documentary for. They, these, these networks actually bought it and presented it as a, in some cases, a CNN exclusive. Let's cut to this tape. Never before seen footage. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi shown fleeing the U.S. Capitol as it was under attack on January 6. The videos captured by her daughter, Alexandra Pelosi, a documentary filmmaker. We have got to finish the proceedings or else we're going to have to come in quickly. She provided some of her footage to the January 6 Select Committee, who played clips in their hearing Thursday. <laughs> I mean, right? I, I, you can't make this up. I mean, again, let's, let's take it your word, Nancy, all right? So you were really scared. You thought this was a big deal. I mean, one, you might have called the Capitol Hill Police, but let's just say, you know, you're really like, you don't have your, you know what, together, and you couldn't get yourself to a phone to do that. 
why do you bring your daughter in? Like, wouldn't you call your buddies at NBC News or MSNBC or ABC or someplace? Like, right? Why is it your daughter? And why is your daughter then turning around and selling it to CNN? They call it a CNN exclusive. You know how this news business works? Somebody buys the tape so then they can run it as their own, as an exclusive. And so that's what we saw over and over again. That's what they played in the hearings. And so I point this out only because we don't know what actually really and truly transpired on the interior of the Capitol building. There's like 42,000 hours worth of tape. Mike Johnson is releasing it all. I think that's healthy. I think that's good. Provided, yes, you can protect certain security measures. Let the public in on this because you are being so incredibly biased and distinct in all of your presentation. This is why it's good. Frankly, ladies and gentlemen, and it's going to the Supreme Court. I know some people are like, okay, you're rolling the dice, but I would rather roll the dice that way and let it go to the best legal minds in America than allow these politicians with their own agendas and their own particular biases to control the narrative so significantly.